Hello everyone. They just clapped me behind the room to start. <laughs> and it's easier for me because I have this microphone and I'm hearing my strange voices, which is not so good. So uh, I'm happy you're all here because uh, we had a party yesterday and I was a bit scared that no one will be there because around four o'clock I heard noises and the party sounds. So this is really good to be here. I would like to thank uh, for the organizers because uh, this is such a great event. And we had this cute red elephant and all the people and all the talks and everything is so cool. And when I arrived yesterday, it was like I'm coming into my room and I've seen this. I took this photo yesterday and the view is awesome. So it's, it's like I've never been to a place like this. And uh, after that, I was like this. All right, this is, this is a place for a conference. Pretty nice. And uh, let me ask a question, why do we go for conferences? And I have an idea that we have three things. First of all, we would like to have a party. Second of all, we would like to learn a few new things. And third of all, uh, we would like to network. And well, the party is easy, right? Because we know yesterday. And learning new things are also easy because I checked the lineup and I've seen a few talks and I've seen the workshop lineup. and. I don't want to say anything about uh, in your name, but I guess you have learned something. I guess you have learned something. But then there is this thing called networking. And it's, you know, I always been asked that, have you been networking on the conference? And I was like, mm, yeah, like it's so easy to go to a bunch of strangers and hi, we have something in common. Let's talk and network. And there is this thing I always do when I uh, am making a talk. Uh, I would like to invite you for a quick game. It only took one minute, and it starts with, please stand up. Everyone, please stand up. Wow. <laughs> you are such, you're such a great audience. I, like, I have like six lines of begging to please stand up. So uh, the rules are pretty quick. Uh, you have to turn the person next to you, uh, if there is no one next to you, because there is a wall, and just create a group or something like that, and introduce yourself and say one thing you've learned on this conference. All right, say so your name, and what have you learned? Some people are trying to escape, but <laughs> that, that door is closed, sorry. <laughs> and you have one minute for that. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Sorry, but I have to stop this great session of networking <laughs> because our time is up. So, we had a great party. I hope everyone learned one thing because I heard a few things. And we just networked. So, congratulations, you have networked. Thank you very much for playing in the game. My name is Gabor Nadai. Thank you. <laughs> if you are seeing me like doing this, it's because I'm always walking on the stage, but I've been told not to walk, so I would like uh, doing this or something like that. My name is Gabor Nadai. Everyone is calling me Mafi. And I came from Budapest, Hungary, which is like 200 and some kilometers from here. I'm mostly into traveling, uh, technology, technology and leadership, and CAT. Uh, three of the things, uh, two of the things uh, I experienced here because tech and leadership I've seen, and traveling I've seen, but uh, I didn't see any CAT so far. These are my CATs. And I'm working as head of engineering at the moment. Where I work is called ingatland.com. I guess you won't know what is it because it is a Hungarian site. It's mostly working in Hungary. And it is the market leading real estate listing portal. Uh, so if you would like to buy a home or rent a home or let a home or anything else, then you should visit our site in Hungary because we are Hungary specific. And when I came to the company more like eight years ago, uh, eight and a half years ago, it was like 48 people. And I was like the 48 people of the company. Now it's like 150 uh, colleagues in the company and there is an engineering department of 54 people. I worked there as an engineer, then I became a lead developer, then after that I became a development team lead, then after that I became the head of the whole engineering department with DevOps, infrastructure, Q, QA uh, developers and all the stuff you can imagine. We are like kind of like 54 persons, but that is maybe 55 because there is a new hiring uh, on Monday. And now I mostly work with uh, engineering managers, architects, and other kind of stakeholders from non-technical sides. And mostly we are a PHP shop. Uh, we are using uh, Symfony and PHP. But also uh, 
the company is 21 years old and we still have lines of code in production which was written by the very first programmers of the site. So we have a 21 year old legacy system uh, which we are trying to improve all the time but uh, it is a challenging thing and also uh, we have lots of tech depth and all the stuff so that is the main challenge of me too, uh, to, to navigate our teams across them. And also we are starting into a fintech project, which is like uh, if you would like to get a mortgage or something like that, there is a site when you can select the best mortgage for you. And this is a new project for us. And uh, of course, it's come with the real estate thing. And this is our office building uh, back in Budapest. All right, if you come here uh, to learn about how to write a pretty good code as a lead developer, then uh, sorry, the door is closed, but <laughs> you can leave because I won't talk about that. Um, Rather that, I would like to talk about the soft skills. And uh, I know it's like, OK, here's this guy talking about soft skills. Nice. Let's go to lunch. But it's like I've seen that always soft skills uh, sometimes and always are neglected a bit. But I think it's equally important as, as the hard skills. And you're asking me why. Because I am here and saying that. And mostly because when you're getting a lead developer or becoming a lead developer, you won't get the biggest impact by writing code. Of course, you still have to write code and still have to make technical decisions, but you are getting your impact mostly with having conversations. And of course, having conversations is easy when you are having a beer or talking about a movie you saw, but sometimes it's not that easy as well. But having conversations about, for example, with non-technical people about a decision, it's not so easy. And that's when soft skills come into the picture. Long story short, uh, if you are a developer and are going to be a lead developer, then you're kind of like shifting from creator to contributor or something like a coordinator. So creator to coordinator. And that's the challenge. That's what you want to win. And those are requiring soft skills. And let me tell you, soft skills, uh, it's a tricky thing because they are soft in their names. We call it soft skills. But it is a really hard thing to learn. And why is that, everyone is asking me. For example, let me say, if you, are, if you never ever have experience with high traffic websites, what would you do? You would Google it, how to develop high traffic website. And you download some Docker containers, and you can simulate the whole thing in your laptop. And of course, you don't have a high traffic website, but you can, you can learn it. You can practice it, and you can all do the things. But Google it, the how to have a hard conversation. You can learn as well and practice it in front of the mirror. But have you ever had a hard conversation? Uh, imagine the hard conversation and do you have this scenario when you're having the thing you want to say in your head and when there is a person in front of you, your head is like poof, nothing and you are saying completely different things and this is a really hard thing to do. That's why you need to have soft skills and that's why you need to improve soft skills. Let me ask you a question. You don't have to stand up right now, I promise. <laughs> How many of you ever have a horrible boss? And it's anonymous, so if your boss is here, they won't know if you're think thinking about that. And if yes, then you can ask, why do you think I'm a horrible boss? How many of you ever had a horrible boss? Not so many. Poland is great. Nice. Well, uh, the last conference where I did this, almost everyone hangs up their hand. And uh, I have many friends who are saying me that they are, that, that is a truth that actually people leaving, uh, not the companies, but their bosses. And that's because most companies doing this, all right, you are the most in your one in your team, every field, and you become a manager. So manage things. Goodbye. And that's it. That's the end of the story. And as you are an expert on your field, of course you're great. But then you are having this new title, this new hat, new anything, and you don't really know what to do. And that's where the most of the leaders, managers, are all kind of people failing. And once I read, you have to put some quotes in your slides, so I pick my favorite quote uh, about leadership and management. It's called like, you manage things and you lead people. It is coming from Grace Hopper. She was a pioneer of computer engineering, contributed uh, mostly to the, to the modern world uh, programming languages. And she was actually worked at the United States military. So she was woman in tech way before that term even existed. And she said that you manage things, you lead people. And you want, you're going to be a leader. If you're going to be a le great leader, you have to be a great manager first. Because when you are managing things well, so things are well, then you can lead the people. And 
Well, they say titles doesn't matter, right? So I checked uh, lead developer, it's one title of the many, and I checked how the company is calling this title. I found around, I don't know how much is that, like 20, but I found around 200 of different title, which is kind of like the same as lead developer. And there is a Wikipedia page which is trying to say what is a leaf developer and you can guess if there is so many titles for one thing then it might be so many things they are doing differently in different companies. And that's true. So you're going to ask the question, what does even a lead dev do? Because you might meet a good lead developer and see what they are doing or you might not because you're in a small team when this is not an existing role. And when I became a lead developer, my mom, mom thinks I was doing computer stuff. And I guess she thinks that's me doing computer stuff with the computers. And after that, my friends always think I'm some kind of hacker. So can you hack me into things? And can you hack into things? And I was like, no, I'm not even close to a hacker. And there was a time when my manager was thinking I am a fire extinguisher because there's always some crashy thing, always some panic, and I always like doing this before going into the battle. And actually there was a time when I was doing this. But what I wanted to do is to solve problems because we are becoming engineers because we want to solve problems. That's, that's, the, that's the baseline. And if you're a lead developer, it's the same. The problems are not the same, but you want to solve problems. And how you do that? how you do uh, as a lead developer to solve problems. It's pretty easy. Uh, you don't have to read that full Wikipedia page of the stub. I can tell you in one sentence, you need to help your team. This is your first focus line, your team. You need to win with your team. How you ask? It sounds easy because different companies having the different titles and the different roles, but here are a few points. If you have a bunch of people working together, they are not a team. They are a group or a bunch of people together. You need to make a team out of them. And it's, it's always, I, always, I will always say this, it is sounds easy, but it's not easy. Because if you get a bunch of, uh, bunch of people, you need to make them collaborate. And not just the developers and not just the QA guy, not just the, the technical people, but the non-technical people. Because if you are working in a team, then the business decision makers have to be working in a team with the technical people. And you play a big role in that. You're going to be kind of like a bridge, or a more like uh, the expression, a glue, which is trying to hold the old stuff together. Because, for example, if a business makes a decision, decision and you know, business always has an idea that we can do it quick, right? Tomorrow? Is it, is it going to be in prod tomorrow? No, because here are you playing a part, because you can tell them that if you are modifying this and this, then we can be in life tomorrow. But if you are not, then it's like three months of work. And th that's where your play uh, comes into the game. And also, you have to make connections, because there, I there are two ways uh, to get really great knowledge cheap. One is reading books and blog posts and stuff. And the second is knowing people. So for example, I do this many times, I write randomly to developers on Twitter and LinkedIn and hey, want to have a beer or a coffee and just talk about you have problems, I have problems, let's see if they have something common and we can solve it together. It's a really great thing and if you're doing it inside your company, not just in your team but outside your team, then you will be the person who has connections around the company and that's a valuable thing. All right, so you had a bunch of people, let's say you now have a team. Uh, you have to motivate people actually. And of course, many people coming in that game because you might have an engineering manager, you might have a CTO, you might have a scrum master, name it. But it is your duty to motivate the people. And you know, they say motivation comes itself, so it's coming from you. But you as a lead developer can actually boost that thing in other people. Uh, and the easiest way to do that actually is just to being passionate about what you do. Because have you ever experienced that if you see someone on your field who is really passionate about what they are doing, you had this feeling that, yeah, I want to do that too. Let's, let's do this together. And that's really an easy thing to do. And people will look up, you, up to you if you do that. And also, they will be inspired uh, as you're doing this. What you also have to do is to listen very carefully. Because almost every time, every people saying just what they want. But sometimes people don't want to hear it or don't understand it. And if you're just listening to people carefully inside your team, outside your team, and everyone, in even the junior one on your team, then you are having this uh, piece of insights which helps you really, really, really great uh, to achieve results. And, you know, 
say things like, well done, thank you for the effort, you are doing really great, because people are getting motivated by that. But also, it, it turns out that actually it's a motivating thing if you say that, sorry, but you need to do this better. I know you can do this better, but you need to do this better, and I'm here to help you. And it sounds like a risky thing to say to someone, but it's actually motivating because they will be motivated to do their job better. All right, have a team. People are full of motivation. You need to have a plan because you know you were a coder, then you become a lead developer, and it's stuff like, all right, I'm not just writing code. People are coming for me to answer questions, and people are interested in my opinion, and I have a voice now, and I can say things. So you need a plan. Uh, plan for tomorrow, plan for the next week, plan for the next month, or even plan for the next year. When I was a lead developer, my plan was like, I kind of know what the business wanted with the software, and I kind of know what is the obstacle in the software to do the job. And I had a plan for like one year, worst case scenario and best case scenario, how to move out the project from the tech depth and how to make steps forward. For example, like three basic things like uh, we are getting automated tests, we are getting screens on the office and we see a big red light if the tests are not green and we, are, uh, we won't uh, release anything until we don't get a green uh, test or so. And we have these plans and of course they are changing all the time because great plans are actually changing all the time. But as you have a plan, you can be prepared for what's happening next. And something changing because everything is changing, I as you realize that we are in changing environments, they say, uh, then if you have a plan, you know where to go next. And that's really important. And also, it is important to keep things tidy. Because, for example, uh, if, there is, if you are the glue or the bridge of the connections in the team, you're also the hammer. Because your job is to crash the obstacles in front of the team. Team is like a train going really fast, so like a Japanese train, which is going really, really fast. And it can go fast, but it cannot really see uh, if there is some obstacle on the railway. And your job is to be like four steps before uh, the team even gets there and move that obstacles away. And it's like, you know, you can do it like saying no to a bunch of things for like uh, uncompatible deadlines or something like that. But it is really important to keep the things around the team tidy and also help others grow. Because you might be having junior developers in your team and it is your responsibility that they won't be junior developers after five years. Of course, they no, don't want to be junior developers after five years, but if they are not getting help, then they're not really uh, accomplishing that. So you have to help others to grow. And of course, same goes, not just uh, in your team and the technical persons, but also the non-technical persons. It's really important. Also, you need a success story, because you always need a success story. You're just being a lead developer, but you never know five years ago, uh, five, five years from now, where we'll be going. And if you're having a success story uh, you picked and you trained, it's way more better for the company and for yourself as well than when you have two months left in the company and they're saying they are the new uh, success story and let's train them. Okay. Uh, by now you should realize that I'm not only sharing six things, but uh, I needed some title which is kind of like, uh, you know, wrap it up. But these six things are the most important for me, so it might be not the most important for you, but for me they are. And also the six hardest thing for me, what I've learned in the last few years. First is, I am the boss of my own calendar. And you might, might look, why do I say that? But it's, it's pretty easy. You are a developer, you are doing 90% of your time coding, sitting in front of a computer and coding. And when you became a lead developer, you will realize that people coming to you for questions and they want answers. And they're doing that like, hey, have you one minute? Yeah, of course, I'm getting out of the flow and I'm listening to your question and thinking about that and I'm answering that. How many, how many of you realize that ever in an office? Do you have a one minute question? Oh yeah, that's many. So. Uh, when I became a lead developer, it, it happened with me that I just realized after one week that I, I never had in that one week one line of code because, <laughs> because I always sitting in meetings and asking, uh, uh, answering questions. And, and then I started to do, all right, the time is the most valuable thing. I know it sounds like a Coelho quote and it's kind of like bullshit, but it really is because the only thing you cannot buy is time. Everything else you can buy. Time you cannot buy. It's, it's, it's a fact. And 
if it's your time and it's valuable for us and you don't want to work more than 40 hours a week because you can really slip into that, then you have to manage your calendar pretty well. And you have to say people that, sorry, as you see, now it's blocked. My timeline is now blocked for working. And what are you doing then? I'm working. And how do you do that? I'm sitting in front of my computer and don't ask frequent questions, for example. Second, I must encourage team decisions. And it might be a bold statement, but in my opinion, a group of people who is working as a team is always making a better decision than one person alone. At the company, we had this story that uh, we had a new CDO and we had a, a great technical problem, problem which uh, included high traffic sites, uh, complicated business logic, all, all the things you can imagine. And the CTO, after two days of meeting and one and a half days of uh, thinking, said us, is the solution, do this. And we were like, it doesn't seem like the solution and we were working on this like three years and you're working on this like three days. And after that we tried to do what he wanted, didn't go well. Uh, and after that the team re responsible for that part of the system, they had an idea. And we did that idea and it's still in production. Because one person cannot see everything. They have to make the decisions as a team. So you always have to encourage team decisions. And that's a very important thing to even the junior member of the teams. They, they could have good ideas. They could have uh, good uh, thinking about problems. And also even the new members of the team. Because many people doing this like, all right, you are new in the team, so you don't know anything about our problems. So just listen and we will ask you like, four months or something, but actually a new people, you know the, the term rubber duck debugging is, is the same with this. A new person can tell you something you, you don't see because you are in the problem. It is hard to say no without hard feelings. It's sometimes easy to say no, but without hard feelings it's really hard because, you know, it's like someone is asking you a question, for example, and you have to say, sorry, no, I don't have one minute right now. That's one hard thing. Or, for example, someone asks you, like, coming to your office and I need right now the answer because it's a decision and I have to go to other places to make that decision. And you are sitting there like, I'm shocked, I have to answer. And you have to say, sorry, no, I don't answer that. Let me think one day on that and after that I answer it. Or, for example, say no when you are asked the question and you're not sure. Many people are afraid to say no when they are not sure the answer. But However, it is an easier thing to do because you say, sorry, I'm not sure about that, let me check it, and after that I will respond to you. And if you do this, you never have a wrong answer. And if you are, you know, you are kind of like forced into the answer, then you can have the situation when you remembering something, you're saying something, then something bad happens, and after two weeks it circulates back to you that you told us to do that. And yeah, because I was like in the corner. So say no, and also say no to unacceptable deadlines, say no to things you don't believe in. And I know it sounds like, come on, we're working in a company, but if you don't believe what the company does, if you don't believe what they want you to do, say no, and you can have another job, you can, I don't know, have another part of the company, but say no to that. And also as a lead developer, please say no to gossip, because as you are just a coworker in the company, uh, you can have this, that corridor gossip, as we call it in Hungary, when you are sleeping your coffee in the morning. Oh, have you heard what about, uh, you know, happened uh, between the two guys after that? And it's a funny thing, but as a lead developer, people looking up to you, and you cannot allow yourself to do such things. So be brave to say no. And start it small. I always suggest this to people. Next time a telesales person call you, just say no. And hang on the phone. You will be, you will be free after that. Four, I work for my team and my users, and I definitely don't work for my boss. Of course, my manager or my boss, or name it, is the owner of the company, and I have to do a few things they are asking me, but I'm not there to do everything blindly they are saying me. And that's really hard because, because it looks like that's the situ situation, but it's not. You are working for your team, because you want to achieve something with your team and you're working to have results for your users. And that's, that's the baseline. You cannot go uh, below that. And if you have, many people have those kind of CDOs, uh, CEOs, engineering managers who, who they don't trust, who they can't work with. And I suggest you, if you're always asking to do stupid things, I mean, not things you, you know, you just uh, don't think it's the best way because you would 
think there is another way because then you can try. But if you, you're feeling in your guts that I don't want to do that, I don't want to do that, and it's def if, if it's a constant feeling, then just quit, get another job. You will find way more better jobs than that. Five, I always have to be prepared because, pardon my French, but shit always hit the fan. And it's usually happening times when you're not expecting it. But if you are prepared and you don't have to be paranoid or something like that, but just, you know, you have to know that what is happening if that happening, what is happening if that is not happening. And also you have to be prepared for the great things because the also the problem I see in many companies that they are preparing to the worst things, nothing worse happening, everything is great, and they are like, all right, we had a result, it's a big thing, let's go on to the next thing. So then you should stop and say, come on, congratulations, we did a great job, we did something cool, let's do this together and let's move to the next uh, adventure. And the last one is one of my favorite uh, gifts from movies, uh, from Pulp Fiction, is I should not be a square. And what do I mean is, uh, don't be a square, be open. And not just, you know, not just uh, open for people, of course be open for people, but be open for ideas, be open for solutions, be open for discussions, and of course be open for people. And I also always say this to not just engineering managers and leaders and all kind of, uh, managers in the company, but everyone who is coming to the company, that you should only grade the people work and their values and what they have done, not how they are closing, how old they are, how many experiences they have or something like that. So only the work which is done should be uh, a grading uh, metric of a people. So be open, don't be a square. All right, are you going to be a lead developer? Congratulations. Uh, there are a few things I want to share on top of the six because I would be really happy if someone would told me these things before I becoming a lead developer. Spend at least 50% of your time coding because the first part when I mentioned that uh, you are the boss of your own ca uh, calendar, it's kind of like because of this. If you are not managing your calendar well, you will find a situation when weeks are going far without any written line of code. And here is uh, the Dilbert comic, which is pretty like my favorite because it's funny, but also it is a very cheap trick you can do. Just put a blocker in your calendar, for example, from 8 in the morning to 10 in the morning. And, and if they are getting to know that this is just uh, a fake event in your calendar, then do some technical gibberish language in that calendar. So for example, I had a, a meeting on Tuesdays called Managing Implementation Details, and everyone in the company was, ooh, that sounds like a serious thing, I, I should not bother them. So do things like this, because it's really cheap, but it really helps you to manage your time well. I hope you won't uh, hurt me after this sentence, but refactoring should not be your mission. And I always see this, I work with many engineers that, oh, come on, that code is, ooh, that, that code is shitty, we should refactor the whole thing. And I was like, all right, but it's, does it an obstacle of something? Oh, no, it's just a shitty code, okay. Does it uh, cause problems? We have bugs, we have downtimes. Oh, no, it's just a shitty code. Okay, is it, uh, you know, is it like a tech debt uh, in which two years will cause problems because if we are don't upgrade the PHB version, then we have problems? No, it's just a shitty code. Okay, then leave it be because <laughs> we don't have to do with that. We only have to do, because we are working in a business environment, I know it's sad, but business first. We, we're working as a business once, and if the business wants something and there is a shitty code which is obstacle for that, then you have to do. Uh, to do anything uh, to, to get that obstacle away. But it's not your mission. Thank you. <laughs> this is a, a tweet from a Hungarian very, very senior developer. Uh, he works at, uh, if he works there, he works at uh, EPAM, which is a software country. And he said there are only two types of code, legacy or dead. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of like the most true uh, piece of line what I ever learned or read about software engineering because at the moment when you release a code, it, it, is, it is a fact that it, won, uh, it will be or that code or, or, uh, or legacy. Because if nothing happens and it's working well, then in two years it will be legacy. And if you left the company and some engineer uh, or some product decision is making to kill that feature, then it will be coming a dead code. So always keep in that mind, every code is legacy or dead. 
beware because if it can break, it will break. I had many situations like this and most of them happened just like an hour before I arrived at the office in the mor Monday morning without coffee and everything, or just uh, in the middle of the night, Friday after many drinks. <laughs> and uh, once I had this story when I was drunk, and I wanted to, uh, I had to go to the office because one of our most critical systems went down in like three in the morning. And I left my laptop in the office because oh, I won't work anything uh, in, the, in the weekend. And from Friday to Sunday, I was in, in the office and doing things. And it is just a small thing. If I just would bring my laptop home, it would be way more easier for me. So be wary, if it, if it can break, it will break. Have you ever heard the term MVP? Who has heard MVP? All right, yeah. That's because product people really like to say this MVP, minimum viable product. And what I learned, they are always doing it wrong. And there is this cool uh, chart, which is the first is how not to build an MVP. All right, if you, if you want a car, and the goal is you don't want to get wet when you are going for shopping, but you want to have a cargo when you can put the things which you're shopping, then you're not starting with the tire and not starting to months. Uh, how to get a great tire and then continue with the more tires and the interior and then the car because on the first point you have nothing on the second point you have nothing on the third point you have nothing and in the fourth point you have something you can sell and that's no good uh, and there was uh, a version of this chart when they said the second line is how to build an MVP so if you want a car then first build a scooter nice then build a bicycle then build a motorbike then build a car that's good, better, better th than the previous one, because you have four different products you, which you can sell and use. But the first, the second, and the third is not, not getting any closer to the, to the goal of the product. And how you do MVP well is the, the third line of the chart, when you are getting that truck. I know it's not nice, I know it's, it's not comfy, I guess it don't have uh, autopilot mode, I guess it don't have this uh, automatic windscreen, but it is the first thing and it is getting closer to your goal. It is your goal because you can go to shopping with that, you don't get wet in the rain and all the stuff. And after that you can put a cargo in the back and you are now having cargo. After that you can have a new shiny metal on the outside and after that you have the full car is completed. So if you ever heard someone do it MVP. They are sometimes thinking that do it quick and dirty, but it's, it's not about that, it's more like this. And clearly I like movies, but better file effect is a real thing. I always think this like, we have a legacy system with a bunch of old code and a bunch of tech depth, and we always have this thing in the office that you are pressing uh, the elevators button in the zero floor on the office, and the Xerox machine uh, blows up on the sixth floor. And it's really like that. So for example, once we realized that the internet went off in the office and the site went off as well. But we don't have servers at the office, it's, it's in the cloud and stuff. And it turns out that there, there is something, some part of the system which is actually in the office. And because we went offline in the office, they couldn't reach uh, the, the office from the cloud. And because no one is knowing there is a feature, uh, the full site is, is went down. And it took hours for us to, to, uh, you know, to go after it and what happened. So butterfly effect is a real thing. You can do a small change and it has great results, but not in the way as you were expecting it. I guess many of you experience this, that if you are switching one bug off, then you have <coughs> another third uh, for that. So, so prepare for that. And what I always also tell to people is, business or anyone who is ordering your uh, product which you are doing is not your enemy, it's your friend. Because you are in together, you are a team, you want to achieve something, you can help with your technological skill and they can help how to sell that. Because, you know, if you have a great software which is a great code and, and everything is great but no one is buying that, then just a nice piece of code. It's not, not a product, it's not a business, you cannot build a company on that. What's the metrics of successful lead dev? Uh, you know, there's this saying, well written code, green builds, uh, good releases and motivated team. But also, a resultful team with people proud of their work. And that's a nice saying, but how you can measure that? And I guess if you can measure code quality, then you can measure the team quality as well. I had Two very easy tricks for that. I don't know if you know Squat Health Check. It's a model being developed by Spotify. 
It's pretty simple. You have these cards, the cards saying like uh, how easy to release, how much we're automating, how good are the products and stuff. And everyone has a red, a green and a yellow card. And in every third month, we, uh, the team is going into a meeting room and they are having these cards and they are saying, all right, how easy to release. The red is like, we are scared of release because there are tons of problems after that. The yellow is like, meh. We could release, but it's not the best. And the green is like, oh my god, we are the best in releasing the world. And you can draw uh, graphics of that, and you can uh, put uh, into a statistic system, and you can do many <laughs> things. But if you are just uh, take a photo of the, the table when you are doing that uh, in the meeting room, it's really helping you uh, to know where to go next. And also, don't be afraid to ask for feedback. So for example, I had this story when uh, one of my friends, actually, who, who I was uh, in with the team and I was the lead developer and he told me uh, next to a beer that I don't understand what you're talking about and I was like well okay it was a boomer it felt like I don't know like falling off the sixth floor and it was like why and he said because you're always sugarcoating the things you're always doing like like you don't want to hurt me and I think a lot about that and it's really like that you are I, I, I always wanted to sugarcoat things and and after that feedback, I get to know that, and I get to improve that, and I get results by that. So don't be afraid uh, to ask for feedback, because it's good. It's hard to accept the feedback, but it's a good thing. And also, we have uh, running short in time, but I would like uh, to share a few favorite book of mine, about the topic, of course, with you. The first is uh, Managing Humans by Michael Lopp. I guess it's not even for lead developers or engineering managers or people who just want to know what the heck is a manager doing, but everyone in the engineering industry should read this book. Read this book because it's pretty funny. It's, it's like funny stories about, about the guy's uh, career, and they have many, many great lessons. He is right now the VP of product engineering at Slack, for example, but he worked at uh, Apple and Skype, if I remember well. Also, there is this guy called Patrick Kua, who is a very good uh, engineering manager, has many great uh, talks on YouTube, you should check for that too. And he writes this book, Talking with Tech Leads. I also recommend you because uh, it really has great lessons. And if you are building teams or have a team, you have to build a team or there is a problem with the team or anything like that, or you need to hire or fire or something like that, then read the, this book, Building Great Software Engineering Teams, because it has also a very uh, lot of knowledge. So the here, here are the key takeaways of this talk. It's like soft skills are important and hard to learn. Help your team creating value for users. Win step by step, so you don't have to win one big time. You have to go like an MVP step by step. Don't need to refactor anything and fix everything. Time is your most important value, really is. Be brave to say no, and also be brave to be open. And last quote, I, I promise the last quote. Uh, this quote, the only man who makes no mistakes is the man who never does anything, is coming from Theodore Roosevelt, 26th president of the United States. And for me, it translates like this. If you work, you will make mistakes. If you don't work, you won't make any mistakes. It's easy. Uh, but if you make mistakes, don't worry about that. Everyone do that. But learn from your mistakes, because that's the important point. So you should identify what was the mistake and how you can avoid it next time. And when you are doing that, you know, constantly, it will get you great results and improve your working pretty well. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you would kindly scan this code and uh, give me a feedback on joining me, because as just I said, uh, feedback is very important. It's scary for me as well that uh, you will say that, oh my god, this guy was terrible, but I can learn from that. So if you would do that, it would be really great. And also do that with the other speakers, because, uh, because this is really a good thing to, to get feedback. This is my uh, second international conference uh, talking, so I, I might have a lot of things to improve. So it would be really great. And if you have any questions, let me know. I've seen the end.